Now as we move out of the Paleozoic era, we move into the Mesozoic era, the second era of the Phanerozoic Eon. And uh, the Mesozoic covers from about 251 million years ago to about 65 million years ago. And I know that number is a familiar number to just about anybody watching this. If it's not, you'll see why shortly. Now the first period in the Mesozoic era that we want to talk about is the Triassic period. That's from about 251 million years ago to about 199 million years ago. Here in the Triassic period, we see a couple of things. First of all, we have a brand new life system on Earth. Remember that we've just seen the Permian-Triassic boundary marked by a huge extinction event. And that event has left the way open for terrestrial um, dinosaurs to take over. So here in the Triassic, we actually see a proto-dinosaur, the archosaur, begin to dominate the land. And that's closely descended from a reptile that appeared in the geologic record in the Permian. Pterodactyls also appear here in the Triassic period. We also see cynodonts. they becoming much more small and more mammal-like. And eventually, here in the Triassic, we see the very first mammals appear. Modern-type corals show up. And there is a major extinction event here at the end of the Triassic that kills about 23% of all families and 48% of all genera out. And most of the non-dinosaurian archosaurs, the rhapsids and large amphibians, they go out too. What this does is leave the real dinosaurs, because the archosaur is not accepted as uh, quiet dinosaur enough to be included in the real dinosaurs. But it leaves place for the new set of dinosaurs to take over the terrestrial landscapes with very little competition. And then we move into the Jurassic period. The Jurassic period, which covers about 199 million years ago to 145 million years ago, uh, we see a whole lot of gymnosperms and ferns. We see some of our favorite dinosaurs, the sauropods and the stegosaurus lived here. Uh, mammals are very common, but they're very small. They're rodent-like, you know, things that are closer to squirrels and rats than anything big. We see the very first birds appear, and we see the very first lizards appear, and you can see my uh, Subadequate cartoons here. Uh, they get even worse as I try to doll actual living things. Um, now here we also see Pangaea break up and Laurasia and Gondwana become their own distinct land masses again. Now the maps I draw here are very very simplified and they're not particularly accurate. You definitely want to Google a better map. These are just to give you an idea of what's going on. There's other land masses involved but we tend to talk about the largest ones. And also keep in mind that when we refer to times that supercontinents formed or broke up, they don't always agree in the literature the time that we state. And that's because the events are very big, long events. There's some dispute as to, one, when it happened, and two, at what stage in the development of that suturing or that separation should you call it and place it in the geologic record. So if you get a little confused, you can look at the different literature. You will find some disagreements, but this is just giving you a general idea of what and when. Now the next thing we do is move on to the Cretaceous. And in the Cretaceous, we see the very first flowering plants. Now the Cretaceous is about 145 million years ago to about 65, 65 and a half million years ago. So we see these flowering plants. We see a lot of our other favorite dinosaurs, the Tyrannosaurus rex, the duck-billed dinosaurs, the titanosaurs. We see sharks that look a lot more modern, recognizable to what we have today. We see that the, the birds that we saw appear in the Jurassic actually begin to replace pterodactyls as the uh, sort of inhabitants of the sky. Here in the Cretaceous we also see the first marsupials and the first placental mammals. Gondwana here starts to break up and a younger set of the uh, Rocky Mountain orogenies begin. Now the Rocky Mountains are a complex orogenic belt of mountains. More than one event has taken place to uh, create the morphology we see today. So this is only one of them and I'm just mentioning it because we're all familiar with the Rocky Mountain Range and it's interesting. Um, also here in the Cretaceous, the atmospheric CO2 begins to approach that of the present day atmospheric CO2. And at the end of the Cretaceous, as we all know, we see the major extinction event that kills out those very, very interesting dinosaurs. It's marked by the KT boundary, which is rich in uridium. Um, 
There's a lot of dispute as to exactly what took place for this worldwide extinction event, but I will, I, you know, I can't present all the different theories and ideas here, but I will say this. In, in 2010, a panel of 41 scientists did agree that that asteroid impact in the Yucatan is what triggered this huge extinction event. And if you want to see a very interesting sort of similar event, you can look up the impact that we were able to observe on Jupiter because it was a smaller impact um, meteorite than we actually uh, think hit in the Yucatan and it created a cloud that was more than the size of the Earth there on the surface of Jupiter. So you can get an idea of how something like that might have triggered uh, death all around the globe uh, at such scales. In this event, about 17% of all families and 50% of all genera and 75% of all species went extinct. And after this, it was mammals and birds that emerged as the dominant land vertebrates probably because they were small uh, sort of rangy scavengers that were able to survive this terrible cataclysmic event and they they probably thrived on the carcasses laying around to be honest and now we move out of the Cretaceous period and we move into the Cenozoic era but before we do that let's take a quick review of the Mesozoic era here we saw in the Triassic our protodinosaurs proliferate. We saw mammals show up. Then a major extinction at the end of the Triassic cleared the way and terrestrial dinosaurs took over. They ruled through the Jurassic and the Cretaceous. In the Jurassic we saw birds, we saw lizards show up. In the Cretaceous we saw our first flowers. And then we saw the huge KT boundary marked extinction event probably from that Yucatan impact that ended the reign of the dinosaurs and changed life on this planet as we know it. So as we move forward into the Cenozoic era, which covered about 65 and a half million years ago to the present day, the first period we talk about is the Paleogene period. The Paleogene period lasted from about 65 and a half million years ago to about 23 million years ago, and it's marked by three epics. Now, previously I hadn't been talking about epics. Uh, they do exist previously. There's a lot more um, separations in the geologic history that we have not gone over. But since we're starting to get into what is geologically recent history for the Earth, I thought we could separate it just a little bit more. Uh, first we have the Pleiocene epoch, 65 and a half to 55 and a half million years ago. And here we see a pretty tropical climate. A lot of our modern plants appear. We have diversification of mammals. They're taking over where the dinosaurs kind of left niches and things for them. And here we also see where the Indian subcontinent collides into Asia and the Himalayan orogeny begins. And remember, the Himalayan orogeny is still sort of active even today. And then we move forward into the Eocene epoch, and that runs from about 55 million years ago to about 34 million years ago. The climate begins to cool here. It's uh, somewhat more moderate. The very first grass appears in the Eocene. Before that, we have not seen what we would classify as grass, but it does show up here very recently in the Eocene period. A lot of ice caps are forming. Antarctica is reglaciating because, like we said, the climate is gradually cooling. And then there is a major event here in the Eocene epoch. We call it the Azola event. And it's thought that there was huge freshwater fern blooms in the Arctic Ocean. And as they died and sunk to the bottom, they created a huge drawdown of CO2, a very significant CO2 drawdown, which reduced the atmospheric CO2 by 80% and triggered an ice age that basically persists to today. Now this becomes very interesting in the light of the global warming uh, controversy, and you can see why there's plenty of scientists who say, um, what exactly is this global warming? We're really just warming back up. We're not warming up uh, in a vacuum. And there's a lot of dispute and a lot of debate here, so we won't get into that, but it is interesting to think about that we are just uh, kind of recovering from an ice age right now. And then we move to the Oligocene epoch. That covers about 34 million years ago to about 23 million years ago. The climate is still okay warm, but it is still cooling. 
mammals are continuing to diversify, and now the flowering plants have taken over. We see evidence of them everywhere throughout the Oligocene epoch. So we'll move forward in time again, and we will move on to the Neogene period. The Neogene period is from about 23 million years ago to only 2.5, 2.58 million years ago. So we're getting very close to where we are now. And the epochs that we're going to talk about here will be the Miocene epoch and the Pliocene epoch. In the Miocene epoch, from about 23 to about 5.3 million years ago, we see that our moderate ice house climate is still kind of persisting. There's a punctuation of ice ages throughout this, you know, 18 million year period-ish. Um, the modern mammal and bird families that we know and love today become very recognizable here in the Miocene epoch of the Neogene period. In fact, the very first apes appear here. And uh, there's a lot of forests in the Miocene epoch. And what they're doing is drawing in the CO2 and lowering the already depressed levels. The, the levels were at about 650 parts per million volume, and they depressed the levels to about 100 parts per million volume. And remember, today we're at about 385. That's the sort of recovery, but nowhere near that, even 650. And remember, the 650 was a depressed level. So. Uh, Again, just interesting food for thought. And then in the Pliocene epoch, which is about 5.3 to 2.6 million years ago, the climate persists cool and dry. Ice house conditions do begin to intensify. And the present ice age, the Quaternary Ice Age, begins about 2.58 million years ago at the end of the Neogene period. Now here we see Homo habilis, a tool-wielding, possible human ancestor about half our size show up and uh, there's dispute as to whether we are directly related to this particular um, species but it's interesting and this is where he shows up here in the Pliocene epoch. 